Okay, so I've uh, got something really interesting planned for today. Uh, we're going to be talking about saddles and saddle fit. Uh, and not just saddles and saddle fit, but on the importance of saddle fitting uh, and anatomical principles, both in the big picture and on individual picture, using my two horses as an example. And I'm lucky today I've got my friend Claire Marshall from Plateau Holistic Equine. Uh, she is my personal saddle fitter. She's my friend. She stayed over last night. We had a couple of Yes. We had a few cups of coffee this morning in my living room and uh, I need my saddle uh, again. I like to keep my saddle as as often as I can. I get her over and she checks the fit, makes sure the fucking's okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, I thought why not film that and kind of go into those principles a little bit more. Claire is also my bit fitter, which is kind of an interesting thing a lot of people don't know about bit fitting, but she is my bit fitter. Um, and if you watched the uh, the recent Zoom with Guided Voice, you will know that she did have blonde hair. It is now reddish brown. Yep. <laughs> but at the time she had the, the bit fitted with Sanson about just over a year ago, she had blonde hair. So this is the blonde person Sani was talking to Shaley about, if you remember that. Um, so I've got my two hungry hippos here. They're going to help us. But Claire, why don't you just kind of introduce yourself really quickly and tell us who you are and what you do. Okay, my name is Claire Marshall. Um, my company's called Plateau Holistic Equine. We um, look at saddle fitting. So I've been saddle fitting now for about 10 years and it's developed really from just a very basic um, fit, uh, design, um, aspects of saddle fitting into a much bigger much wider approach to the whole horse the whole horse the entire horse so everything from the nose to the tail is taken into consideration taken into consideration and also rider uh what's called um you know looking at the rider's anatomy so we're looking at the biomechanics the anatomy of the horse but also the biomechanics of the rider as well because any saddle fit is 50 percent for the horse and 50 percent for the rider we, do, we have re various compromises we can make, but at the end of the day, we need to make sure that everything is fits, that the kind of jigsaw puzzle fits together in terms of the rider comfort and the horse comfort. So there That's is what that. I really liked in talking with you, is that when you came out to do the initial fitting, you said it really is 50% the horse, 50% the rider. The saddle has to fit the rider and it has to fit the horse. Both exactly. have to work together. Because yep. if the saddle fits the horse, but it's not a suitable saddle for that rider or what that rider does, mm -hmm. that rider's not going to be in balance, not be in coordination with their horse and the best saddle fit in the world's not exactly. going to help, right? Exactly. And yeah. we, have, we have these compromises to make because what a horse might need and what a, a, a rider might need are two can be two completely different things for example for example we have um, a, a horse that might need some support in one area so if they have they so we're, when we're looking at the saddle we're looking at the tree the seat the panel the flap those are the four basic areas now there's so this thing called the 32 point fit which we can go into a, on a later date or a later session but yeah. Um, the basis is is that you have you may need to have a, a rider for example that needs a, a lot of space in the seat needs quite a flat seat and you have a horse that has very little space to put that seat onto. Rider needs a big saddle, horse needs a small saddle. Exactly. Mm, and exactly. how to put that together. Yeah, so mm. these are the kind of compromises that we have to take into consideration. But often there are, you know, maybe difficult conversations that we have to have mm. with the rider as well mm. about the suitability. Um, you know, which is which we can get into those kind of real complicated yeah. conversations about the suitability of the horse and matching the horse with the rider. Mm. However, we try our best within our parameters and within our evidence-based practice to make sure that, uh, for example, rider weight is correct for the horse. Yeah. Um, that there isn't kind of an overspill. Uh, or we don't have. We're not over 
overweight, putting an overweight rider on a horse. And often with horses with very little space, we have these aspects of things like pounds per square inch of pressure, mm. which can contribute. Yep. Yes. Um, which can contribute to, which means that our, our things like our panels might be the wrong shape, or we might need something a little bit different. Mm. Um, so these are these are like the questions that we have to ask. Um, but in terms of the saddle itself, um, the first thing that we would want to do is to really look at the horse. And the horse is knew that was going to happen. Did we get that on camera? Sunny. Do I need to hold you? <laughs> you were very funny. Never seen you do that before, mate. If he thinks there's nothing onto the thing, he's like, why am I tied up? And that's why I had you on the breakaway. Let me just hold him, shall I? So as we were saying, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> it's really important that uh, we discuss the, the suitability of the horse for that rider. Absolutely. Have you ever come across situations where the horse is might the horse might not be suitable for riding? Yes. So what I was going to say was what the the first thing that we do before we even look at a saddle, especially on an initial fitting, on, mm. a, on an initial consultation, is that we look at the horse we look at asymmetries in the muscle structure and the skeletal structure we look at the horse move we're looking at the feet uh, we're feeling over the horse's body for any sensitive areas um, asymmetries in the face the neck the head because um, when we were talking about bit and bridle fitting mm. the two tend to go together although we won't do the two in the same session because right. they're, they're too involved and but definitely what i plan on doing at another stage is to have claire come back out and we'll actually conduct the same thing like what we're doing now with saddles but with bit fitting. I think it'd be really interesting because a lot of people don't know that bit fitting is a thing. They just go to their tax store and say, I've got an Irish sport horse that won't stop at the trot. How, what bit do you recommend? And it's, it's, it's kind of an over, dangerously oversimplified way to approach putting a piece of metal in the horse's mouth. Uh, and when it comes to actually fitting the bit, you know, the, ana the anatomy of the mouth, all this sort of stuff, I found really interesting. So that's definitely something I want to get into yep. you with. Yep. But what I'd like to do now, before we actually get into doing my saddle, because Claire's actually going to reassess my saddle fit today, and if we've got time, there's another saddle of hers that she has that I'd like to try, uh, and I'd like to kind of film a comparison and see what that looks like. And we have Caleb here, not just as support for Sani, because I don't want Caleb being by himself in the paddock all morning, but um, I wanted to kind of dive off into a more generalized discussion about horse anatomy and suitability for riding or not. And I'm so lucky that I've got two horses. I've got one that's a riding horse, one that's a non-ridden animal. Uh, and for very good reasons, I think. And I can sit here and give my opinions why, but Claire's perspective from 10 years being a saddle fitter, approaching the horse's anatomy and biomechanics from a really detailed perspective, mm -hmm. she could say this with a lot more intelligence and sensitivity than I could. So <laughs> I thought she could kind of explain that. So. I'm going to start with Caleb mm -hmm. and I'll let Sani walk around if he wants to because he's decided he doesn't want to be tied up today. But I'm going to bring Caleb away from the hay. Why don't you follow us, Kira? Kira, cameraman. Claire, why don't you kind of, um, I'll take care of Caleb here. Why don't you kind of talk to me about Caleb? My question is, if you saw this horse in a saddle fitting and someone said, this is my horse, I want to ride them, please fit a saddle for me. Would you say to them that this is a horse suitable for riding? Okay, so we're today we've got two very different horses that we are going to look at and make some basic observations for saddle fitting on their anatomical structure and those implications for the biomechanical movement of the horse and what kind of limitations that movement might exacerbate in a ridden environment. We're also going to look at the potential for remedial exercises that may be helpful to prepare that horse for ridden work. Mm. So Caleb here has some very distinctive features about his back anatomy and his shoulder anatomy that we would like to talk about in terms of a saddle fitting environment. Mm. When we're looking at his shoulder, I'm just going to move over this direction, we can see <coughs> 
he has so I'm going to just kind of mark out here um, I can just kind of draw a line and to where his basic anat anatomical structures are so we have the shoulder blade here the scapula and these are all basic functions that these are all basic anatomical aspects that we use on every saddle fitting, every new saddle fitting that we do. And we like to use these as a visual indicator for the rider, for the owner, to understand the relationship between the size, the shape, and the, the kind of margins that we're working with, with each and every, with each horse, because each horse is different. Even within breed types, you have variations. So for Caleb, he actually has quite a wide scapula here, okay? <clears throat> he has what we would call a croup high natural resting posture now that has implications for movement and it also has implications for um, what you can do on the horse itself what are the implications exactly so <clears throat> with a croup high horse often we see that there could be um, a, a precursor for what's called a kissing spine where the vertebrae, the top of the vertebrae can touch and can cause severe pain. Often these horses in this posture where we have a distended rib cage here, croup high formation here, we often see that these horses can be quite heavy on the forehand when they're moving, but also it's a weakness in the back and potentially a lack of ability to what's called lift. And carry weight and to carry weight yeah. yeah so with a horse like him so i'll draw on some of the basic structures for saddle fitting for him and we're lucky we've got a little bit of a dusty horse that we can do this <laughs> and the wonders of the andalusian weather <laughs> um so with him i'm just drawing on i've drawn on the scapula or the shoulder blade here i'm drawing on the what's called the trapezius muscle here now the trapezius muscle is important because it is a part of here which intersects with the part of the saddle so if we're looking at treed saddles it's a part of the saddle which sits over here and it can but it also has um, direct relationship with the mobility of this part of the horse and this part of the horse is your direct contact with your seat mm. okay so we have a muscle that sits something like this it's like an upside down triangle and it's split into two sections okay we then have um, a muscle that sits down the back which runs all the way down here and this is our main saddle support area the longissimus okay? right yeah so this is called the longissimus dorsi um, it, it's not really a name you need to remember, but it's just a visualization approach to understand that this is our direct interface with the horse, okay? Now, every horse has a slightly different, some have a wider one, some have a narrower one, and that will then dictate the panel that we might use on the horse as well. But we have to establish how much width we have in the spine, and then also how much length we have, most importantly, how much length we have for a panel to sit on the horse. Now, with Caleb's posture, his resting posture is his shoulder blade is lower than his croup or rump. So okay. this would be like my, my first reaction to that would be that a saddle is going to be thrown onto the shoulder yep. of his body and even with heavily corrective panelling and padding, mm -hmm. the saddle's going to be thrown onto this part of his body, creating a lot of pressure and a yep. lot of heaviness in a place that's already quite heavy. And as I know from taking care of his feet for the last two years, uh, he's got moderate to severe mediolateral imbalance in his feet as well, and a bony column disalignment all the way down through his, his leg, through his distal limb. So that, plus this problem, for me, as a professional who's interested in riding a horse selflessly and ethically, I have ridden him, uh, and behaviorally, I've ridden him with nothing on him, and he's happy for that. But after 10 minutes, he's just going, ouch, ouch, ouch. So for me, 
I'd look at a horse like this and I'd say, I'm, I'm probably not going to ride him. And considering he's almost 20. Now, if you've got like a four-year-old horse with this sort of crew high, downhill, distended belly, at that young age, you've got a little bit more room to do corrective exercises, mm -hmm. to change the soft tissue. Uh, and then if you intervene with the foot at an early enough age, you can correct some of the bony column issue. But at his age, a lot of things are kind of set in stone. Mm -hmm. Would you ride this horse? I wouldn't ride this horse. Yeah, okay. some people might. Yeah, so what we often get people who send us photographs of their horse, so we always ask for video and photo before we, we even entertain a saddle fitting. And to, to honestly save the time and money, if I saw a horse like this, I would be pointing them in the direction of some basic, very basic, low level, low impact um, remedial exercises on the ground. So for example, the use of stretching, the okay, use buddy. of... Um... Caleb's having a moment, everyone. He's a little bit worried. Oh, You're all right, buddy. Caleb. You're all right, buddy. You're all right. And what we would be doing is we would be looking to encourage the lifting of the what we call the thoracic sling so if you think about the column the, the spinal column of the horse you have your cervical vertebrae which are in the neck you have your thoracic vertebrae which form part of the rib cage you have your lumbar vertebrae which sit just behind the rib cage and then you have your sacral um, vertebrae which go all the way down to the dock and, and the tail um, with a horse like him, as Lockie said, we, if, if, if we had a vet, uh, if we worked with a vet with a horse like this, who said, the vet said that we would, they really need to em employ some very low level ridden work to take weight, we would have to use a very specialist saddle which had the correct width of panel, but also a shortened panel which sits underneath the tree which is the rigid part of the saddle, underneath the tree, so the, the panel doesn't go any further than that 18th rib. And the 18th rib is, the 18th thoracic rib, is the limit at which you can put weight on the horse's back. In his case, if you had something that went beyond that, you are, like Lockie said, you would be risking the saddle being moved forward as the lumbar area of the horse, especially in the trot and the canter, comes up you would be that would be moving forwards painful so, and it's painful um it stops the shoulder from correctly rotating because the the shoulder blade rotates backwards so this is where we get into the question of what size saddle what size seat would i should is the correct one for my horse and how does that then relate to how i'm riding and my size and my um a most comfortable ridden posture. So with him, I would be referring him to a good groundwork trainer, a good gymnastic trainer that is ethical, that is kind, that can work quietly with the horse to teach them how to engage the rib cage a bit more. Now I am going to see if Caleb will lift because one of the one of the things that we do do at a saddle fitting is we look at how much upward mobility the rib cage has. So I'm going to see if he'll allow me to do that and see if he does have lift in the rib cage. So all I'm going to do when I'm doing this, and a physio might have in the past asked you to do this, uh, what are called tummy lifts or belly lifts to help get that mobility into the rib cage to prep the horse for riding. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my hand and I'm gonna look for the edge of the ascending pectoral muscle here, which kind of runs down here, this part here. And then I'm gonna just scratch under there and see if he will give me some lift. Now he, he really, he's quite an averse reaction to that. He finds that really, really difficult. And so if I had that response from one of my fittings, I would then refer on to a vet, a physio, and a remedial trainer. And you'd be recommending not to ride And I would be horse. recommending not to ride your horse at this point. So now. I don't know if you know this, Claire, but in the summer, I've talked about it on the video library before, but in the summertime, I had his sheath cleaned with my vet and he was uh, uh, sedated for that. 
and in, in exploring his sheath, we discovered that he has a tumor, benign tumor, mm -hmm. inside his sheath, mm -hmm. that any time he would engage his hindquarter, mm -hmm. tuck his pelvis underneath, mm -hmm. engage his stomach muscles as an ancillary response, that sheath, the sheath tumor is in such a specific position that his thigh muscles on the inside actually knock onto that tumor and when the vet was touching the tumor, um, even underneath the, the sedation, mm -hmm. he was very uncomfortable and trying to kick. Mm -hmm. So for this horse, it's so unique that collection is actually a pain button yep. for him. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if he didn't have that sheath tumor and he was younger, there's so much we can do on the ground to rehabilitate the way he uses his body. But putting all of that together, we'd kind of say ethical riding of this animal is almost, almost impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In this, in this instance, because we know his history, we know pretty much 95%. We know what is causing that lack of ability to engage the muscles that are really essential for riding your horse. And so what kind of behavioral problems could a horse display? If you're trying to ride an animal and you're having behavioral problems at home mm -hmm. and you may or may not know if they're tied into their anatomical predisposition to be successfully ridden mm -hmm. what sort of behavioral problems would you come up against so you would come that anything ranging from the very subtle so um facial expressions there is an ethogram that um the, the Sue Dyson's ethogram on facial expressions in, in comfort in the horse. It's something you can look up and it's, it's freely available and it's a really useful tool. So anything from just cocking the ear back and holding it there for a length of time, um, showing a slight white of the eye, wrinkling of a nostril or a lip, um, showing any tension in the neck, um, a lack of ability to stride forwards with the forelimb, Planting, uh, napping or moving sideways, um, just inability of going forwards, um, tail swishing, um, evasive behaviours, um, uh, you know, biting when you want to do the girth up, um, get that, but that could be a, an indication of a whole host of things going on. Um, adverse reactions um, in terms of not wanting to be mounted, not standing still at a mountain block. What about nervousness when they are being ridden? Yeah, so, so those... Or dominance displays, quote, dominance displays when being ridden. So this is where we go back to the facial expressions and those are symptoms of those nervous uh, responses, if you like. Um, and he's a pretty expressive horse. I mean, we're filming him and you can kind of see uh, a host of thoughts and feelings running through his brain because his face is so open and he's, you know, looking at me for treats, but he's also confused about what's happening to him in this moment. You know, he's a pretty expressive horse. So in that sense, you're lucky because he will always tell you what's going on. Some horses, they might become incredibly shut down and dull, mm -hmm. heavy to the leg, not moving forward, mm -hmm. um, general stiffness, Blah, blah, blah. So Go those on. are the horses that are a lot more difficult to unpack and unpick in terms of saddle fitting, because we can only deal with one thing at a time with a horse. The horse can only deal with one stimulus at, 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 a, time. Uh, at a time to be able to give us an indicator of where they're uncomfortable. Um, they have an enlarged amygdala. They don't have um, fully, you know, the, the same development in, in prefrontal, front, cortex. prefrontal cortex, frontal lobes as the human brain. So we have to take things really slowly. And what, so, so the indicators that you can get with a ridden horse that they're not comfortable in the back and they're not comfortable in the saddle are the same, can be the same responses that, sh that show up as pain for an unrelated issue, maybe an injury issue. But also horses being the um, prey animals that they are, are hardwired to hide their discomfort until it becomes completely unbearable. Mm. And of course, when you get those which have a much more subtle indicator that they're not comfortable, those are the ones that you have to kind of unpick more in terms of um, going very much back to basics. Um, you know, the first thing that people generally say is, oh, the saddle must be the problem. 
and you can have a session where you change the saddle three or four times and you know the saddles there are, there are slightly different aspects of the saddle that might be good for the horse and, but you know that every time this horse is displaying a behavior that is not you know that that is it's is, is this com uncomfortable and that's really when you have to say look i don't think it's the saddle that's causing this i think you really need to speak to someone else someone else barrier yeah, vet, barrier vet something. body worker okay. behavioral therapist etc that was really interesting because I've, I've spoken before when I'm working with Caleb, I've said many times, almost every time Caleb appears on my video library, I always say, look, let's look at his anatomy, we can see, etc. But it's so great to have a saddle fitting professional, biomechanics professional to explain it in more detail. So what we're going to do now, Claire, if that's all right with you, we're going to let him go. I'm going to give him hay on the other side of the arena fence and he can chill out over there. We're going to bring Sani in and then we're going to talk about sort of Sani's body type, not necessarily so much as an individual, but more the archetype of suitability for riding with him as, as a juxtaposition to Caleb. Cool? Okay, yeah, I just want to make, I just want to kind of add to that that yeah. this is the very, very basic, this is the incredibly basic um, points that we're, we're talking about. There is yeah. a whole multitude of other things that are going on with this horse that really we offer another session, I think. Yeah. Um, we're just looking at the very, very basic aspect of is this horse suitable for riding? Is this horse not suitable for riding? And taking a, a kind of self-reflective and critical analysis view of whether we ethically should or we shouldn't. But there are lots of other things that we can talk about and that we can unpack in a later session with him as well. Yeah. Cool beans. <laughs> you can he, smell. He knows he's on camera. And he knows he's on camera and I've got the alfalfa pellets. So I'm just going to do nothing. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Right. So, <clears throat> Sani is a Hispano Breton. Um, he is a very different confirmation to Caleb. And this is really to give you an idea of Stop it. the different confirmational um, aspects of the horse that we have, which, which inform saddle fit. Um, he is uh, Lockie's ridden horse. He has, um, in terms of his basic and anatomical structures, he has quite an upright shoulder blade. He has a moderately high wither. He has a very much flatter profile in the spine than Caleb does. He has a very strong, powerful and um, uh, shallow sloping croup. Uh, he has a good second thigh. He, in terms of his structures, he has an even longer, wider, sorry, um, uh, scapula or shoulder blade than Caleb. Than Caleb does, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and this is partially be down to uh, the part of his breeding is a draft horse, but a draft horse that isn't necessarily particularly wide. Now draft horses, we, we fit a lot of horses that are very wide and very short. Very flat, like and table very tops. flat. Yeah. yeah, so hardly any wither, very, very wide shoulders. And that needs a very specific tree, a very specific panel, a very specific tree that is suited to these horses. But is Sunny a typical draft fit? So no, Sunny is actually, um, more like the fit of a Spanish horse. Um, he is part Spanish, part draft. So he is deceptive. The fitting of Sunny, he actually is only what we would in a typical English saddlery term call a medium wide fitting. So a medium wide fitting can, you know, we can have thoroughbred Spanish horses, warm bloods, um, some American Saddle horses, you quarter know, horses. Qu quarter horses are a little bit wider generally, but okay. yeah, I mean, like I said before, even within breeds, you have variation in shoulder angles, wither angles, wither slope, etc. Um, and we really have to take, take each horse on their own merits. Now, he actually has a very very wide spine channel so he has a spine channel that i would usually associate with a draft horse um, and he also has a, a rib cage that is 
sprung out was here. Now, with Spanish horses, we often get a slight drop off at the rib cage, depending on bloodlines, etc. But he does exhibit in this part of the rib cage, he exhibits more of a draft conformation. Okay. Now, his length, his, his longissimus dorsi muscle, if we look at the width of him, he actually has a very wide longissimus dorsi muscle, which means that he can take a really nice wide panel. Now we work on the premise, or I work on the premise, that we use the flattest tree profiles that the horse can take. <clears throat> now he is a much, a much better confirmation for riding than Caleb. And I would think that if I try ask him to do a tummy lift, he will be much more receptive and he will have some really good lift in his rib cage. And this is really down to the low and slow conditioning work that Lockie does with his horse. And we have an environment here that's really well suited to that kind of work. We have a variety of terrains, we have a variety of footing. So if I do the same thing that I did with Caleb, I'm going to ask him to lift uh, by running my hand down that edge of the extending pectoral muscle and ask him to lift the front of the rib cage. And he is much more receptive in doing that. And you can see as I do that, the front of the rib cage comes up here. Mm. What also happens when we do this is the intersection between this trapezius here and the longissimus dorsi here, it gets wider and it gets flatter. So when I talk about using the flattest trees that the horse can take, we are fitting to that profile, not to the relaxed profile of the horse. Mm. An engaged profile engaged like they were profile. moving exactly so right. what we want to do is we want to make sure that the profile of the tree so that's the underside of the tree where the panels support they are flat enough um, and that the horse can do this lifting can perform this lifting movement correctly because that lifting movement is essential to create the right kind of stretching here and here so that they can carry weight of a exactly. rider responsibly exactly. and ethically. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So if you didn't know Sunny, and if you didn't know he was um, he was a ridden animal, <laughs> and someone presented this body to you, mm -hmm. and they said, Claire, in your professional opinion, is this horse suitable for riding <clears throat> purposes? What would you say? I would want to. The first thing I would do is I would look at him uh, walking and trotting in hand. I would look at his footfall. I would look at any observations about any shortcomings in the limbs. Um, I would ask him to lift. I would feel down the back. I would feel down the croup. I would ask. I would ask him to do some lifts in the lower part of the lumbars here by running the hand. Why down. don't you show us that? Okay. So, Basically. what we can do to, to so we've done the lift at the front of the rib cage. We want him to lift at the back of the rib cage as well. So to do that, you can find the edge of the hamstring muscle, and the hamstring is this one that runs down here next to the next to the dog. We can just take a finger or a pen, and we can just run our hands down here, and we can do it at the back, and hopefully we can ask him to lift. There is one that I do. A little bit of a lift, not much. The one that I do is I do this uh, this technique and this technique on the opposite side together so I'll I'll try it on I'm short so bear with me <laughs> um, I'm going to do it on the left side of his rump and I'm going to do it on the right side of the rib cage and see if this works yeah wow. so you can see now how much he lifts bridges and li lifts into almost a roach um, formation in the lower spine, in the lumbar area. I like to see how much of that they have and that will dictate how I might flock a saddle because often... And flocking is... And the flocking is the stuffing of the wall inside the panel. Right, okay. Okay, so stuffing, padding, pillows, depending on where you are in the world, there's a slightly different terminology for it. Um, that will dictate how I will stuff the saddle because what we don't want to do is we don't want to just stuff it the same all the way through. Depending on the working posture of the horse, we might flock a graded flocking. So that means we might put it softer in the front and a little bit more support in the back. But again, this thing goes back to the biomechanics of the rider 
on where the rider's seat is most comfortable. So if I can talk to you then about like my personal preferences, me as a rider and the way I'm built and the way my pelvis works is that I like to sit sort of just behind the wither. I don't like to be all the way back here and I don't like to be climbing on top of their neck either. I like to be just behind the wither and I personally like a really uphill seat. I don't like a really flat western or an endurance seat, but I don't want an uphill seat like the dressage deep seat that's going to like smash my family's jewels to pieces, right? So I like a really uphill seat, which is why I got a Baroque saddle, because that's got that nice sort of sloping uphill seat. Of course. So that, yeah. So in terms of where we want to seat the rider, and I'm going to go back to some images from ancient history. Um, Claire's also an archaeologist, in case you don't know. She gets into saddle fitting from historical archaeology and historical course, saddles, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so my yeah. background was really in designing historical saddles and um, Cascading from there. Yes. So, if we look at um, images from classical Greece, uh, from the archaic period and the classical period of ancient Greece, no, most notably the Parthenon, um, uh, sorry, the, the yeah, the Parthenon marbles, the the Elgin marbles, as they're called, if we're getting into colonial um, uh, discussions about um, uh, names. But um, if we look at the uh, the, the Elgin marbles and we look at some of the equestrian images from there you will see that these bareback riders are seating themselves absolutely just at the base of the wither and this is really where we want to seat riders here is is just at the base of the wither in this part here because this is the pivot point and this is the balance point and the path of least possible resistance when the horse is moving got it um, so the problem with a lot of saddle design is that it doesn't put the rider close enough to the wither. A lot of mass-produced saddles today put the rider too far back behind the movement where they're not effective enough. And so... Or balance. Or balance. So balance is everything. With saddle design, balance is absolutely everything. And there are when we look and we unpick a lot of the design aspects of, of saddles produced today, because we're looking at saddles with very deep seats for the riders. Uh, with Huge knee blocks. Big knee blocks, yeah. uh, where they are predisposed then to riding in a specific style, which then puts so much pressure into this part of the horse's back. What we, what we want to do is to assess the rider and the horse together so we can put the rider in the most effective position on a saddle that is, that is offering the most freedom in this part of the horse's back for the, for the horse itself. That's so good, Claire. So um, that's really good. What I want to circle back to right now is before we're going to get into some saddle fitting now, because um, yeah, I really need my saddle looked at. Um, I think no one watching this video doesn't need to be told how important having a good saddle fit is if uh, you are interested in riding. You know, I've got a ridden and a non-ridden horse. I love them both, right? So if you're not riding your horse, there's no shame in that, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, just in case someone is like, oh, you know, I can just buy a saddle off Amazon and it says it's for a full quarter horse bars, so I've got mm -hmm. a quarter horse, or it says it's great for draft horses. It says it's a warm blood saddle. I've got a warm blood. Just in case someone is in that place, um, how important is the best possible fit you can get for your horse if you are going to ride? How important is that in your professional opinion and ethically for the horse? Yeah, so when we look at buying saddles online and this, you know, with the advent of um, you know, a pandemic where people have been stuck at home and people have been looking a lot more online for a saddle, um, we get these questions a lot. Um, you know, what does this fit look like on this horse? And there's a whole host of variabilities, of variables that we have to employ to determine whether we can say yes or no, because at the end of the day, our reputation is also on the line. Yeah. Um, so we can work remotely, but we still need to access the kind of information that we would need if, if we were seeing the horse in person as well. And more often than not, what I find with people who do buy saddles online is that um, they find that the saddles don't fit. Uh, they then find that over time, 
the, the behavioural responses of the horse are becoming unmanageable and they don't quite know why. And we get it. There are places in the world where you can't access a saddle fitter. But you said that you can work remotely online, yeah. but you need access to specific information. Is Absolutely. that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what I would usually ask for, if somebody was wanting to buy a saddle online, uh, I would want um, pictures of the horse uh, standing square, both sides on level ground with no tack. I would then want a set of uh, photographs where we've done the belly lift to see if the horse can lift the rib cage. So a set of photographs like that. We would then want a, a photograph looking over the back from behind, also standing square with no tack. Um, I would then want to see some video of the horse moving freely without any head collar, without any lunge line. Uh, in walk, trot and canter and that has to be a high resolution video because it's no good having grainy video of me not being able to see the horse's movement. movement. Um, I would then want to see um, the saddle on, uh, I would like, want to see the pictures of the saddle off the horse and pictures of the saddle then on the horse. So it's pretty comprehensive. Yeah. What I'm hearing you say is that you, if you're going to do that online, you almost need to kind of put together a how to yeah. gather the information for me sort of tutorial video. Yeah. And what I'm hearing you say is that if you're interested in riding your horse and you're interested in the horse doing that comfortably uh, with the minimum of behavioral barriers and problems, mm -hmm. um, with the minimum of damage possible to the animal, Working with a saddle fitter, whether in person or online, is kind of like a non-negotiable yeah, if you're going to ride. Yeah. And what we do find is that there is a kind of ethical level that we have to employ. And if somebody comes to us and says, oh, I've got this, is this going to do? And it's like, well, and, and I can't send you all the info that you want. And, it, and, and there is a very, there is a line drawn there and saying, well, no, actually, we can't, unless, you, if you can't provide us with that information, then we can't really, help. we can't help. Um, it's so important um, and we see so many competition horses, um, you know, young competition horses, not me personally, that have had their limbs injected on, you know, several times and they're only 10 years old. But what we do find is sometimes that when you get some of these professional stables that are using one saddle for several different horses and we're seeing a lot of horses that um, have had their, their hocks injected or their stifles injected and, and training course, on training, butte. training on butte and uh, you know I know I can talk about this with Lockie because and Lockie's channel or Lockie's kind of followers. She's safe because, here <laughs> to tell me these things. Yeah? These are ethical implications yeah. for the riding of horses that we are kind of singing from the same hymn sheet also I would hope. Um, so we are. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it's really, really important for us to have as much information as possible for us to determine correct fit. Now, I'm an independent saddle fitter. Um, this means you don't, you're not associated with one brand. I'm not associated with one brand, but I do have a set of preferred. saddles, preferred saddles that I like to use. Yeah. And there are very specific reasons for that. So I couldn't just say to somebody, if they came to me online and said, Oh, this saddle, I, I've just, I think it, it, I find it really comfortable. I think it's a good fit. And I, and I don't know the brand. I can't honestly cast an opinion because I don't know what tree it is, how the tree is made, the design of the rails, the angle of the rails, um, the, the panels. Do, does this company have a tendency to, to stitch in panels at an angle where you have to make some remedial uh, steps to, 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 to rectify the problem? So. So there are those things as well. So generally I have my go-to saddles and after 10 years of doing this and working with various companies, this is, I feel very comfortable where I am now with the saddles that I use because I feel that there is kind of something for everyone within that range. But I will be very honest about my own limitations that I, there are literally hundreds of different saddle makers, thousands of saddle makers in the world and I can't possibly know have an intrinsic and intimate knowledge of every single one so that's a bit of a disclaimer and a bit of a caveat as well so what i suggest we do now is we look at the saddle that i've got for him at the moment um and we just kind of have a look at it on its own and then pop it on him and kind of go through go through that mm -hmm. yeah so, 
Lockie's, so this is my saddle. This is Lockie's saddle. It is a Doiber and Partner, a DP saddle. I bought this secondhand from a lovely lady in Switzerland who was getting out of horses and she had used it, I think, for one or two years very infrequently, so it hadn't had a lot of use in it. It's a 2012 model. It's called a Desmond O'Brien Baroque Schuler saddle, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. It's a discontinued model from DP. Uh, much, much older DP saddles, I believe, don't have the adjustable head plate at the front, but this mm -hmm. is one of the models that the front of the saddle, you can insert an Allen key and it would open and close. And this mm -hmm. is much of the, the reason why I wanted a DP, because I like that adjustability if you've got a horse that changes shape quite frequently. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't buy it from Claire, I bought it from this lady, but Claire has done, what, four, five fittings yeah, with this saddle? Yeah, there's quite a few that we've yeah, done adjustments. with this one. So, yeah. so with this saddle, um, it's a Baroque style. It's based on um, some of the 18th century schooling set, um, saddles from um, the German and French schools. Um, but it also employs, because um, Doiber initially were known for their Western saddles. So some of the design aspects of Doiber's Baroque saddles also employ um, some of the principles of the Western seat. Um, namely, the actual profile itself, as you can see here, it has a flat part here, and then it has a, um, a with a, an, an uphill piece here, partly because the um, Allen key goes in here, and this is where the mechanism is housed um, for the Allen key, okay? And what that does is when you twist it, it opens and closes here. Now, one of the really nice aspects of Doiber saddles, and this is a, a saddle, the Doiber saddles are a saddle that I've fitted now um, since about 2014, and they have a very open head. Open what head, does that mean? So an open head, as we can see the profile here, it's more of a U shape, okay? You have saddles that are very V shaped. So if you look at comparisons between, for example, some older English saddles, or a vaquero saddle, a Spanish type saddle, they have like a kind of fork shape at the top, um, which is very closed. The one thing about the DP saddles or the Doiber saddles is that when you open this, the profile flattens out. So you can put these on horses from about a medium up to a doubled or triple X wide. And the reason you can do that is because the profile underneath here, is really quite flat. And that okay. is good because... And this is good because... The muscles can swell. Exactly. To, to yeah. build strength. So these muscles here that she was talking about before, the trapezius and the longissimus, this zone here needs to swell in order to carry the rider. It's of sort course. of like if I went like this, uh, to yeah. carry a rider rather than go, uh, to carry a rider, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that helped, that elicits the strength in the rib cage. Um, so the, they have a baroque panel on them, and the pan, these panels are similar to some of the Portuguese saddles that you might know, you might have seen. Let's just catch this on camera for a second. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, Caleb. We've got very unhappy, suffering, retired, non-ridden animal here. <laughs> cool. Let's go back. <laughs> Living his best life, right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so these saddles have a baroque panel. Um, this, the panels are nice and wide here. They have support down the front and it's quite straight. So if you've got a horse that has very little space in the rib cage to take a saddle, you don't have any um, forward angled panels here in the leg of the panel, the stuffed part here. Um, and of course, here it sweeps upwards. So we don't get any weight bearing part of the saddle here, mm. but what we do have is a good stability aspect mm. um, on the horse's back. And actually it might look like compared to some English saddles that it's bulky, but actually it's a very neat um, close saddle, contact. close contact saddle. So the tree is made out of, this is a plastic molded tree and it's very flat. It's like this yeah. thin all yeah. over. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a discreet tree. It's called the Ultraflex tree. And it's kind of, if we look at the shape of the seat here, the tree kind of follows the shape of this seat, but it's also got an element, a small element of flex longitudinally as well. So this part does kind of mold a little bit in the seat. Mildly flexible, but not so much that, you know, we're going to get pressure, get pressure points. points. Exactly, yeah. okay. exactly. Um, so this saddle is actually a really nice shape for Sani because you can see Sani has quite a prominent wither. 
okay and if you look at the profile of Sani and you look at the profile of this saddle you can see that there is a really nice shape here to accommodate the wither but unlike some English saddles that have a high wither design it also is flat under here because we can go into uh, I'll go into a little bit more about the English saddle tree shape and why deep seated English saddles can often be problematic um, but we can employ a deep seat here while still maintaining a flat profile here for the horse by the addition of these galleries and that's what they're called the, the front and rear galleries um, all right why don't we put it on sunny and kind of see what it's looking like okay last time claire fitted this was sort of at the end of the spring so we're in late january now so that was let's six seven months ago and i would say i've ridden it lightly to moderately since then um, I love this saddle, but I'm not like 100% happy with its fit in this moment because the flocking is natural wool fiber and the flocking can compress, it can move throughout the panel because of the movement of the horse. And Sani's got a lot of movement and he's kind of hyper mobile, both the way he moves his legs this way and the way he uses his spine this way. So that can kind of move the flocking around so much. And that's why, for me, I like to have her check it whenever she's in the country because she works between UK and, and Spain as well. So I like to have her check it, especially if I'm sort of get, getting into more riding at any one time. Uh -huh. So why don't you okay. talk to me about what you're seeing. Sani, it's fine. It's fine. So um, Sani's saddle, we, we make kind of small adjustments with it when, when we do a refit. Um, so with him, what I did is I put more support into the front here. So we have slightly softer flocking here and, and a slightly firmer flocking here. The reason for that is, is that Sani's wither is very steep. And with U-shaped heads or with open heads, what you can often get is you can get a dropping down, which tends to tip this up a little bit and put the rider into this position here. Yeah, and that has happened to me on this yeah. saddle. So what we want to make sure is that the seat of the rider is between here and here. Now this is very different to an English saddle and you might think, well, oh, it's too far back. But these saddles work in a slightly different way. So we need to make sure that the weight is off here for, and that the, the, the rider's balance over all terrains is firmly in this part of the seat. So if we can see here that this is the part that sits parallel to the horse's back. And if we ask him to lift, we want to make sure that's still staying parallel to the horse's back. Okay. So what happens with these saddles, because they're flocked with a, uh, a, a soft grey-brown wool, um, there are various different grades of flocking that we can use for various different jobs. And it depends on the kind of job that the person's doing uh, and to how long they can actually go between maintenance fits. Um, but with him, what we would do, and we know that we need to fit it with one of these two pads that we have here. So we have a DP felt and we also have a quite lump felt um, sheepskin uh, lined. Um, so depending on what Lockie wants to do with Sammy will depend on which which pad we might prefer to use. Basically, in any given if I'm working time. like flat work in the school, I'm going to use this pad. If I'm going to go off around here that you see, Sani, you're being belligerent and impatient today, then I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to use this one. I've got the world's most disrespectful horse, haven't I? Ever. Never. Okay. <laughs> so for him, um, because we know the history of this saddle and this horse, for him, I know what I need to do to give this a little bit more support up here. So you basically need to put more into the front. So we'll put a little bit more into the front. That's And what I then thought. we will take the, a pad and we'll fit it to that and we'll have a look at uh, Lockie riding with, with the preferred pad. Um, because this compresses quite quickly, we know that we can just add a bit more at the front. I do not want to change the angle profile because I think that would be too much. But what I want to do is to just maintain and regulate the flocking here through to about the middle of the saddle. Perfect. So that's what I will do for him. So why don't we do that? Yep. Let's do it. And we can actually show them the tree underneath and they can yeah. see the profile. Yeah, so of the tree yeah, you well, just keep so. talking. Okay, so we've got Lockie's saddle here. Um, and what I've done is I've just unscrewed the front of the panels because our holes to put our stuffing in are just down here. Okay, can you see that? And this is the stuffing that we have 
and it's a very very soft uh in england it's called jacob's wool but it's actually not just from the jacob's sheep because jacob's sheep aren't gray but anyway um so this is a very very soft wool um when we're flocking a saddle we have to make sure that we're using a grade of wool that is absolutely the same or as close as possible to the original what we don't want to do is to start having um, a flocking that is predominantly this and then we're putting something like a, a white wool over the top because we can see here we've got two different grades of wool now these are this is english wool this is all what's called a roving top and this is the outer longer strand of the wool from the sheep now this is really important because longer strand wool keeps its shape for longer okay so our brown have... our gray wool gray or brown wool and they're two very distinctive greys. The white one is a slightly coarser grade than the brown or the grey. And in this case, because we have completely we completely restuffed this about a year ago, less just like less than a year ago, yeah. maybe nine months ago, we completely took everything out and restuffed it. And we restuffed it with this softer stuff. So as I as I usually say that the, the brown wool or the grey wool needs a little bit more maintenance. Uh, uh, to make sure that we're maintaining the balance so what I'm going to do because we've just we've just taken this is actually a good opportunity for you to see the tree on the underneath of these saddles you can see that there is a wide profile here um, there is it's very very flat in the back of the rail and it does have a slight flexibility um, they have changed a little bit since this this is quite an early design but you can see that this is the head plate here you can just about see uh, in the imprint, uh, imprint of the leather that this is where the adjusted plate is so it sits on the underside of the um, the injection molded tree and then you have a little bit of flexibility in these points as well so flexibility in these points means that you do have to often put a little bit more support in the front of the saddle because those 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 points are flexible and they're there to stop any um, um, clamping onto the back of the, the the cartilage part of the back of the scapula or shoulder blade blocking the shoulder yeah exactly cool so what i'm going to do is i am going to use some i have some flocking irons here and these are uh shaped um, instruments sort of, of torture instruments of torture <laughs> in the wrong hands <laughs> say no more but all these are to do is to regulate because what we want is we want what we, we've got it slightly softer in here and slightly firmer in here but we want to make sure that it's even and graded into this part here on both sides in the same so what we're doing when we're flocking is always feeling down the panel to make sure that there are no soft spots and that takes a quite a good touch right it takes practice and there are no right and wrong ways of flocking a saddle okay okay so you'll have various schools of thought you'll have some schools of what the society of master saddles in britain may well say what they often say is that you have to just flock over the top you never push into a space and then flock behind but i've found that as long as you have a lining in so when the when these panels are made they'll have a lining in them and that lining is there to stop balling so they'll have a little very balling meaning the the flocking the, 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 gathering, the into, gathering a ball. One into a ball got it so what we'll, we'll have is we'll have like a foam lining often so that you don't get any of that happening okay great so all i'm going to do with this is i am pushing this into into the leg and pushing it down and then I'm going to add flocking into the hole and into the back of it. Now, really, I should have this on a, on a, on a surface, but we... We're doing the best we can in the rural yeah. Spain, in the back of a car. Yeah, but this actually, you know, something like this vehicle is really good for yes. having it at the right height. So you can, um, you can work and, and constantly look. Because all you're, you're doing is you're feeling and looking all the time. So I'm just going to do it. I'm going to let this video run. I won't say any more, but you'll you'll be able to understand um, the process when I'm. Uh, so it's a kind of uh, action, observation, action, observation. Got it. So, Claire's just reflocked the front of it. 
and we're just going to briefly kind of go through what she's done and how that looks different. Okay. So why don't you bring it over to Sani and pop it on Sani and see what you've done. So as you saw, Claire took it all apart. She put more flocking in the front of the panels and then we put the stirrups back on. Uh, the width at the front, she didn't have to adjust. The width was appropriate. So what we've got, around this side. what we've now got is something which is sitting a little bit up and more up at the front. It's offering a little bit more support. So this negates the possibility that we get a tipping at this point here, like this. Saddle going forward, yeah. So what the stability then will keep the rider into this part of the saddle, which sits parallel to his back. Okay, so I'm happy now that that has um, an evenness and a regulation where we can go ahead and put the pad on so we're fitting it to the pad, not to the horse like this. So we have to flock it according to how much additional pad that we've got underneath. That's so, so much better. We'll pop, we'll pop the pad on yep. and then we'll have just have a, a brief look uh, on board. Yep. Good? Yep. Why don't you tell them, tell them a little bit about this weird girth? So this is a girth that I've been using for about a year. It's called the Schaaf, uh, designed by a lady called Christina Schaaf in Denmark. And it's the Schaaf Freedom Girth. And this is a girth which we've been using on horses that are sensitive, that need some um, extra support here, but also the flexibility of having something that moves with each muscle group. So it sits on the intercostals, which are these under here, and then it's supported on part of the ascending pectoral, which is here. Now they've, we fit these a little bit longer than like a standard girth, but as you can see, it has movement variability here. It is strengthened on the inside here with a type of um, marine nylon that's been rated to a thousand kilos of pressure. And we have um, independent moving elastic um, here with a padding that sits under the buckles. And what we found on horses that really like this kind of girth is that we're helping with increased stride length. And of course, there's a, there, you can have them as a dressage girth, a jumping girth, cross-country girth, Western, Icelandic. And also now there are some new ones which uh, are with, for horses that have a very, very forward girth groove as well. So it's a slightly more anatomical shape. But we're finding that uh, certainly Lockie's feedback with this girth was that Sani um, feels increased like he is, his, 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 his increasing his stride length as well. All right, why don't you attach it on that side? I knew this skirt was different when I bought it and it came with instructions like how to put it on properly that you don't do it up to max on one side and then wrench it up to max on the course, other because yeah. you're pulling the muscles off to one side if you do that and it wanted it actually instructed you to attach it incrementally so that you know each side of the girth is attaching in like even levels of pressure without like pulling muscles off yep. to one side. The only way you can adjust these is by doing them incrementally on both sides. Yeah. What do you think about elasticated girths that are elasticated on one side? So the problems that we have, and we see this a lot with saddle fitting, is um, manufacturers are still making girths that have elastic on one side. Problems there being is you have, for example, a, a wooden tree and still a lot of English saddles and a lot of Baroque saddles are still made with um, birch ply composite wooden trees. You can find that there could be a, uh, a, it can elicit a twisting over time in the saddle tree. And then of course the problems that arise with that is that you have to replace it at a lot of, a, a, like a big, quite a big expense. Um, also it causes instability. And of course, when the elastic stretches uh, you cause instability, um, lateral instability in the saddle as well. So we try and avoid it at all costs. And it's something that it's one of the first things that I talk about when I'm examining a new client's girth as well, because girthing is just as important as the fit for the horse and the fit for the rider. Saddle felt yesterday before the fresh fit. 
bla bla bla. Okie dokie, my friend. Oh my goodness. So you know how I say I like an uphill seat? I'm now no longer having to like adjust the saddle. I just feel like my pelvis is just sat where I like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've got the support at the front, but I can feel the cantle at the back. And I'm not having to brace anywhere just to sit nice and aligned. I'm not the world's perfect rider, but I'm certainly comfortable enough for Sunny's purposes. Okay, so what we've done now, um, when we're fitting a saddle, we can't just do a static fit. Um, we have to see the rider uh, riding to gauge any improvements, any good or bad changes. Um, so what we've done here is we've we've flocked up the front. Now you will look at this saddle and you will think, oh, well, the front actually looks quite high. Um, now, we can't, we, they don't fit like an English saddle. So if your usual saddle is an English saddle, these are quite a different fit. And also we have to take into consideration that Sunny has quite a prominent wither. So this profile of saddle works really well for him. Um, because what it's doing is it's putting the rider into the part of the seat that we want. And like I mentioned before, Doiber saddles actually have their basis in Western saddle fits. So often you get that. So even though I look like I'm not in a Western saddle structurally, yeah. it sort of is, it, right? It is, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, so Lockie's seat is being supported by the gallery at the back, which is an independent piece of the structure of the saddle. It's a, a separate part of the saddle tree. Um, what I'm looking for is a good um, fluid and relaxed movement of the shoulder that Sunny is heel first landing and striding out on the forelimb that he feels like he's got a fairly relaxed neck. What we'd want to do is because he's been stood around waiting for us to finish talking, um, we need to give him a few minutes of just adjustment time so that he feels like he can um, move his body and warm up a little bit before we then start talking about feedback on the saddle fit itself. So we can see straight away that his shoulder, I mean, his, uh, his shoulder is uh, nice and loose. What we're looking for, the, the muscle on the top of the neck is nice and relaxed uh, and that he is willing to go forward, that the saddle itself is staying stable, that there's lateral stability, that's the side to side stability in the saddle. Um, we want to make sure that our rider is absolutely where they need to be, that the shoulder hip heel alignment is correct, that they're not feeling like they're having to guard their pelvis, um, that they can sit in a neutral pelvis and be as effective as possible in the seat to perform all of these movements. And um, that the, the, the saddle doesn't tip. So what we do is we'll look at the saddle before and after the session um Loki is now um doing a little bit of lateral work with sally oh, sort of ish <laughs> laterally ish and he's also gravitating towards his new friends over here so just tell me Loki, how this feels compared uh, to so when i rode the saddle yesterday and in the subsequent weeks i did feel like i had to bring my thigh sort of rotate my thigh in like this onto the front almost to kind of stabilize it here and here because it did feel like there wasn't enough support mm -hmm. in the front. And especially if we went down like a slight downhill, I felt this that kind of going That you were following on. the back and that you're being pushed onto the pubic synthesis. Yeah, yeah, and so, and then it was starting to be slightly unstable like towards the back as well. Mm -hmm. And now I'm feeling like I can sit center of my, my saddle and I don't have to roll my thigh in. Mm -hmm. I can if I want to for a certain movement purpose, mm -hmm. but I can just kind of sit where I like to sit, which is actually a slightly everted toe. Mm -hmm. I like to have that slightly open toe. I don't like to do, you know, this situation. Mm -hmm. um, I can just kind of sit open with my thigh here, not be blocking him with my knees. And I feel like the saddle's holding itself at the front. Okay. And so for me, that's already exactly what I wanted from today. Yep. Um, yeah happy with that good thanks so much claire you're welcome pleasure we're we gonna no are we done he says we're done are we done <laughs>
Yeah, good boy. We're done. Oh. <laughs> uh, you superstar. <laughs> good boy. Good boy. <laughs>